thank you very much, Matthew, and for this very nice uh, introduction. And I'm going to share my screen. I hope it's you can see it. It's all okay. Um, first of all, uh, of course, I would before I start my lecture today, I would like to thank the uh, organizers of this wonderful uh, seminar series, uh, the American Research Institute in Turkey, the Institute of Nautical Archaeology, and the Maritime Archaeology uh, Research Center of Koch University uh, for this wonderful uh, opportunity to give this online seminar on uh, Byzantine seafaring in the Aegean today. And it's uh, really a, a great honor to be uh, with you tonight. So um, following the traditional way of defining Byzantium, the Byzantine Empire is generally characterized by three main elements, also called the pillars of this empire. First, Christianity. So the Byzantine Empire is the very first one which established or manifests uh, Christianity as a state religion. Secondly, Roman tradition and ideology, as well as Greek cultural heritage. Uh, of course, because we are talking about the Greek influenced Eastern part of the Roman Empire. But in fact, the real element of its power, so what actually shaped the empire and therefore is closely connected to its historical development, was the control over the seas. Accordingly, similar to uh, this map based on Homer's conception of the world, the Byzantine Ecumeni, so not just its territories itself, but its entire sphere of influence is orientated around the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, with the Aegean Sea being basically the center of the world. Consequently, the formula of success throughout Byzantium's history of more than a thousand years. So we are talking about one of the longest lasting empires in the world, was the role and the importance of seafaring and its consciousness of the uh, need for swift action at sea in order to sustain its leading and dominating power in a period of sweeping changes, which we will discussed today through different aspects of seafaring and coastal activities. So what Matthew just mentioned is that the aim of, of this seminar is not so much to present a single site, whether a brick site or a harbor site, but rather to provide a rough general overview of maritime developments and to put them into a wider historical context. Why is that so important? Because um, working on specific sites, we uh, sometimes tend to lose the bigger picture. The bigger picture which provides crucial information to understand uh, what we are facing and what we are dealing with when we are excavating or whatever. But why to choose the Aegean Sea? Why is it so important? Well, it is the only maritime landscape that remains more or less under Byzantine control up to the 15th century, which means that it forms its maritime heartland until the very end. This allows us to reflect Byzantine maritime activities and developments throughout its entire existence. Furthermore, all trade relations between the Black Sea, the Southeast Mediterranean, so the Levantine coast and Egypt, and the Central Mediterranean, mainly the Italian peninsula and North Africa, are based on maritime connections, which most of them, if not all, run through the Aegean Sea. As such, the Aegean islands formed strategic stations to command the passing shipping lanes. And to ensure a permanent establishment of power, different players, such as the Arabs 
and later the Venetians and Genoese, as we will see later on, initiated strong efforts to gain control, particularly over Crete, uh, Rhodes, uh, Eubium, and of course, other Aegean islands. This means that Byzantium was, from a certain time onwards, not only faced with new competitive markets and socioeconomic antagonists that endangered its leading role in commerce and communication, but also with hostile fleets along its coasts and actually within its heartlands that seriously threatened the control over the maritime trade routes. The maritime trade routes and shipping lanes were mainly dependent and based on coastal seafaring, as we know, due to the necessity of stops, uh, simply for water uh, or food supply, but also not to forget due to the access to local markets. This is reflected not only by the dense network and hierarchy of harbors and other coastal infrastructures, which among other functioned as commercial hubs, as well as the main gate for communication and transfer. But it is also clearly shown uh, by the so far documented uh, wreck sites from the Byzantine era. Based on the more than 200 uh, shipwrecks of Byzantine provenance or uh, Byzantine context that have been recorded, as well as based on the just mentioned port network, we can see two main trade axes passing through the Aegean Sea. So coming from uh, Constantinople and leaving the Marmara Sea and the Dardanelles, one runs um, along the Asia Minor coast, uh, southeast towards uh, Cyprus, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. And the other uh, actually just crossing the Aegean Sea, passing through the archipelago of the Northern Sporids, the Euboean Gulf, south around the Peloponnese towards west, towards Italy and uh, North Africa, etc. Human migration and the appearance of new civilizations around the Mediterranean, which not only challenged the Byzantine naval uh, supremacy, but uh, had a major impact on wider geopolitical and economic affairs, evoked important alterations and innovations, starting a period of transition. And this can mainly be observed in the developments of uh, harbor construction on the one hand, and shipbuilding, as well as the circulation of fines, so the cargo on the other. And these are actually the th these three aspects we are going to uh, have a, a very short look at. So let's start. After the last major uh, naval battle of antiquity at uh, Actium on the 2nd of September 31 BC, the Roman Empire finally controlled the whole Mediterranean Sea, forming a so-called Mare Internum, uh, uh, internal sea, or mare, also called Mare Nostrum, our sea. The incorporation of the sea started a period of political and economic uh, stability and prosperity, peace, for some, let's say, 300 years, known as the Pax Romana. But following those centuries of stability, in a world with an enclosed maritime economic system. During late antiquity, the European landscape changed dramatically in all respects, entering a time of political and economic destabilization. Due to human migration, as I already mentioned, new civilizations and kingdoms, such as the Goths between the third and the sixth centuries, the Huns in the fourth and fifth centuries, the Vandals in the 5th and 6th centuries, even the, the Slavs and Avars in the 6th and 7th centuries, as well as the Arabs from the 7th century onwards, spread around the Mediterranean and changed the economic situation and even more so the political balance. 
and what for uh, the Byzantine Empire and particularly the Aegean Sea is uh, very imminent and important it is the establishment of the Vandals, as you can see in Northern Africa, uh, the Ostrogoths in Italy, and later the Slavs uh, and the Balkan uh, Peninsula, and uh, the Arabs pushing from uh, east and southeast. We will see that uh, later. However, in contrast to the Western Roman Empire, in the Byzantine East, a certain, I would say, political stability and economic prosperity continues at least up to the fifth century AD. This is shown in harbor works, where both at new harbor constructions uh, or even in maintenance works, we have the use of obus quadratum. So basically the use of big, nicely cut ashlar blocks set on top of each other. So we have one big central harbor infrastructure, which at least at bigger sites show an imperial face with uh, quite often elaborate facilities and materials such as marbles, as you can see here uh, in the case of Ephesus. For submerged installations, so those ones protruding into the water, like moles and chatties, we have a continuous use of hydraulic concrete, um, a Roman invention of the first century BC. By mixing mortar with quicklime, seawater, and then aggregates as a mortar binding material, such as, for example, volcanic ash from the Gulf of Naples near uh, Puteoli, which was widely exported as far as Caesarea Maritima, the concrete was able uh, to harden not only evenly, but much faster, uh, and also uh, to harden in marine environments, which is in our case very important. Based on the description by the Roman architect and engineer Vitruvius uh, Polio, rectangular wooden forwards or so-called caissons were used, which were prepared on land and subsequently sunk into the water in order to be placed on the seabed for the filling of the hydraulic concrete mixture. Remains of such wooden caissons have been excavated at a series of sites, as you can see, for example, here at the harbor uh, of uh, Lechion on the Peloponnese. In terms of shipbuilding, uh, uh, traditionally what we call the Greco-Roman uh, technique, the commonly used construction method for the Mediterranean ships at that time was the hull first technique, which had been uh, well known and used for centuries. In this method, uh, planks, planks were uh, butted up against each other edge to edge with the ship's hull being built from the keel up. The planks were fastened with pins, which were in turn fixed vertically by means of mortars and pennant joints. As soon as the floor timbers, as you can see here, were set in place, lending shape to the ship, the hull's upper part was pulled up and afterwards strengthened with the key ribs and framing timbers. The same of course, also applies to the steering system, uh, which again follows the traditional classical system with the helmsman or the navgliros traditionally using the classical quarter rudder on either sides of the ship, uh, which we can also see in numerous uh, depictions, Byzantine depictions, uh, like uh, in uh, manuscripts or in mosaics from the 4th century up to the uh, 12th century uh, AD. So the early and middle Byzantine, what we call early and middle Byzantine period. In terms of the Aegean Sea, mainly from the 6th century onwards, 
geopolitical developments start having a major impact on the maritime landscape. The first event is the so-called reconquest of North Africa from the Vandals in the 530s. We have just uh, heard before about the establishment of the Vandals in North Africa. Uh, and under the reign of Emperor Justinian I, um, uh, there was um, a, a reconquest of North Africa happened, which of course opened the uh, African markets for Constantinople. And thus we observe uh, a sudden inflow of pottery, mainly uh, African red slip wear at various harbor and wreck sites along the shipping lanes. <laughs> The second uh, major impact or event um, is the so-called Slavic invasion, uh, which now mostly affected coastal activities as it was limited to the mainland of the Balkan Peninsula. So what does this mean then? The Byzantines were not so much concerned about losing control over the interior land but mostly about losing the big port cities and other transshipment centers. Why? Simply because the Byzantine Empire realized that only the control over the seas, so to have command of the passing trade routes and shipping lanes, for example, to North Africa and the West, would secure economic and political power, for which the control over the coastal zones and especially over the Aegean islands, which played a decisive role, were necessary. As such, under the reign of Emperor Justinian I, and we just heard about him and his successors, a comprehensive building program was undertaken to fortify the cities, but also to, to build a chain of new fortifications in strategic positions. And these were closely linked to uh, coastal infrastructures and particularly to harbors. Uh, so as part of that, also a series of harbors along the coast and especially on the islands were either renovated or rebuilt by shifting them to better protected areas. Although the 6th century Byzantine scholar and historian Procopius of Caesarea informs us about the continuation of Roman harbor traditions, uh, at least for submerged structures, so what we heard before with the uh, hydraulic concrete, um, the composition of the filling, so the composition of this hydraulic concrete is getting much different. Uh, and this is actually, this is the key point. So uh, as you can see here, different harbor sites uh, indicate that much rougher material, including uh, huge rock boulders and coarse ceramics uh, were thrown in, which meant the reduction of mortar. Uh, and most importantly, instead of using some kind of volcanic ash, uh, like the Roman uh, Pulvis Puteolanus from the Gulf of Naples, or any similar additives, mostly crushed brick was used. You see here as an example, uh, a mortar sample from the Hagia Sophia. So basically we can see um, the reuse of all kinds of available waste material. The same happened also for facilities along the shoreline like key structures. As you can see, for example, at the harbor of Skathos in central Greece, uh, which is an island in the uh, archipelago of the Northern Spore, it's just uh, on the um, line of the shipping lanes towards Constantinople which I investigated a few years ago. The key line was built using the ancient construction method of opus quadratum, but not by using ashlar blocks, 
but instead adapting the hydraulic concrete technique, which means that small um, wooden formworks were prepared, were manufactured, um, loose stone blocks, um, smaller uh, pieces from quarries, so waste material with mortar was filled, and so kind of stone blocks uh, produced, which were not, uh, not ashlar blocks, and then uh, put on top of each other in the classical uh, way. This shows that uh, the Byzantine Empire uh, obviously neither had the resources nor probably specialists or architects and engineers for elaborated infrastructures, but was in immediate need of building of building measures. While Byzantium was struggling on the Balkan frontier, uh, it definitely could not cope with a new player, the Arabs. The Arab conquests posed a, a, a real threat to the Byzantines as they challenged also their naval supremacy. Due to the fragmentation of the Mediterranean into independent kingdoms, and especially the quick loss of Syria, and most importantly, Constantinople's uh, grain basket, Egypt, to the Arabs in the 640s, the Byzantines had a real big problem and therefore were forced to act quickly to replace Egypt in order to secure the supply of Constantinople and the Anona Militaris with grain and other agricultural products. Well, the most uh, suitable region, more or less under state control, was Boeotia and Thessaly in central Greece. Consequently, a series of new harbor sites and transshipment centers were built towards the end of the seventh century. So like the outer harbor of Thebes, or as we have seen, Anthedon uh, and Larimna, where we can observe a new construction method. So taking the hydraulic concrete technique, uh, again, one step further, a chamber system uh, was uh, established or used. So the infrastructure neither entirely uses hydraulic concrete nor ashlar blocks. Instead, probably some reused uh, ashlar blocks from uh, around were placed just in the way to form chambers which subsequently were filled again with a rough conglomerate of quarry stones, core ceramics, and mortar. And this allowed a quite fast and robust construction of harbors of certain necessary sizes to export uh, the grain and agricultural products. However, pertaining an inexpensive technique with just available construction materials and labor means. Furthermore, did not only its own fleet need to be flexible uh, with the new challenge and outmatch uh, the new enemy, the Arabs, but also uh, merchant ships had to be built with less labor and more efficient use of available material in order to be more competitive. So a heightened production demanded a reduction in time and costs a ship needed to be built. As such, the first signs of a transformation where the focus shifted from stability and size, so thinking, for example, of the big grain ships in, in the Roman and very early Byzantine period, to a faster and lower priced production process became evident with the adaption of the so called skeleton first technique. Unlike the uh, uh, aforementioned hull first technique, the skeleton first construction method places priority on the framework of the ship. Here, the frame or skeleton of the vessel is erected first and subsequently covered with the planks of the hull. A very characteristic example of this development in shipbuilding from the Aegean Sea constitute the Yasiada shipwrecks, 
where we see that uh, while the early earlier fourth century uh, brick is still entirely built in the hull first uh, technique, the later seventh century uh, Yasiada uh, brick shows a, a mixed technique. So basically, uh, both methods uh, combined in one, which places it exactly in this important tra transition period. A similar phenomenon can uh, also be seen at the uh, production and circulation of pottery, and especially amphora as transport vessels. So while we have in the very early periods a uh, uh, wide distribution, for example, like the late Roman one amphora, and also uh, amphora types from uh, Palestine, uh, Syria, from Cyprus, throughout the uh, Mediterranean, um, from the seventh century onwards, uh, we, we have new production centers, mainly on the Aegean islands, uh, the southeastern Aegean islands, with the global amphora, but also uh, production uh, centers for the early uh, or the first uh, Ginsunin uh, amphora types on the island of Euboea. So we can see, due to the loss of Egypt and the Levante, that also that one moves, shifts to uh, the Aegean uh, Sea. While by the 9th to 10th century, uh, the Byzantines eventually gained the upper hand in the struggle for naval supremacy, which obviously led uh, Cosmas Indicoplestis in his world map to refer to the Mediterranean again as the so called Romaikos Corpus means the Roman Gulf, the real winners are the Western powers, especially the Italian city-states like Venice and Genoa, who start establishing merchant colonies in the Byzantine East, gaining so more and more economic power. And this initiated a new form of harbor, the so-called Scala or Scala-type harbor. So uh, with different merchant quarters, like the Venetians, the Genoese, the Jews, and the uh, Byzantines, all in one place, they all possessed their own independent mooring facilities. And that, of course, changed the shape and also the character of the harbor from a central imperial harbor area to a basically widely spread, loose, and rather simple infrastructures, mostly consisting of wooden piers or small chatties. A very characteristic example is, uh, for example, the harbor of Almiros in central Greece, where we do not find uh, one harbor area anymore, but single facilities stretching over eight kilometers. Finally, uh, with the Fourth Crusade, which resulted in, uh, let's say, the temporary conquest of Constantinople, and thus the partition of the Byzantine Empire in 1204 AD, the Western powers become permanent actors in the Aegean. So, obviously, we, we get a lot of uh, Western influences from the 13th century onwards, and this is most evidently reflected in uh, shipbuilding and specifically again by the uh, development of the steering system where we can see the replacement of the classical quarter rudder with the medieval stern mounted uh, rudder. And uh, here you can see uh, some examples of uh, Byzantine uh, fresco and uh, graffiti. Of course, although the stern-mounted rudder is no Western invention, uh, but has been used in different parts of the world long before, such as, for example, by the Arabs. And he, here, actually, you can see a depiction of a mixed technique, a uh, ship depiction using both the stern-mounted and the quarter rudder. Uh, despite that, only with the introduction uh, and use of the so-called pintle and gudgeon system by Western ship types like the cog. This rudder type was 
seemingly manifested in the Eastern Mediterranean. Additionally, Western influences are again also reflected by the pottery, with a lot of imports from the West into the Aegean Sea, such as, for example, Proto Maiolica ware. Finally, concerning harbor infrastructures, with the development of the so called Scala type harbor, we see mostly small, roughly built mooring facilities basically pure functional structures not to not fulfilling any other purposes such as a representative or so which uh, gives us a very very different picture to the uh, early harbors we have seen at the beginning so in conclusion based on the developments both in shipbuilding in harbor construction and the circulation of goods from the 4th to the 15th centuries, we can distinguish three main uh, eras. Uh, one uh, up to the 5th century AD, one between the 6th, 7th, and the 11th, the 12th century AD, one between the 13th and 15th century AD. And uh, as you see, it is probably no coincidence that these more or less coincide with what we define the Byzantine time periods. Now, as we have seen, uh, looking at only one of the maritime aspects may give us an, already an, an indication, but it is only one tessera of the entire puzzle. So only looking at all of them, so looking from different angles, provides a clear picture. As such, it is of great importance for maritime archaeology to connect shipwreck assemblages with archaeological sites on land, such as harbor sites or production centers that allow a better understanding of the, I would say, quite complex maritime history and Byzantine cultural heritage. Thank you for your attention. Alkiviadis, thank you very much for that presentation. I appreciate it a great deal. You were a really able to summarize a great deal of, how can I say, diverse and complex information into a straightforward narrative of what was happening over the Aegean Sea to the Byzantine Empire over centuries. So it's very impressive. Thank you very much. Now, obviously, we're going to open this up to questions. I have a few myself, but are there any, is there anyone else in the audience that has a question they would like to ask? Please put it in the chat, and I'll try and relay it. Nothing so far? Okay, well, one of the questions I had, you mentioned how there's a need to in a way synthesize large sets of information to come up with larger narratives and how there's always an interest in taking shipwrecks, for example, and putting them within a larger context. So one of the questions I have is that you had a nice image talking about, or you had a nice image demonstrating the gradually shifting borders between say the area controlled by the Byzantine empire and then the area that was gradually conquered by the incoming Muslim empire. But I'm also familiar with some of the shipwrecks that have been excavated by the Institute of Nautical Archaeology, as, as you are. One of them is the 7th century ship from Yasada, and then the other is the 11th century ship from Serta Lamana. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, for those of you who don't know, these two ships sank, you know, kind of within the context of these shifting borders between these two empires. And so I'm curious from your perspective, how do these ships possibly represent these, you could say the changing fortunes, these shifting borders? Do they represent what we see on the maps? Do they illustrate something different? I mean, how would you relate them to those events? Well, if I understand your question correctly, um, those, I mean, we have to think of, of course, what I presented is a very, very rough overview. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, uh, any, kind of, of development neither takes place 
consistently nor mm. evenly in all regions mm. uh, so obviously this all differs from from uh, within the centuries and also in, in the periods mm. um, in the areas um, those ships I mean we I think we should not we quite often let's take it from that angle we quite often try to duplicate our modern way of perception uh, of geographical borders and also, you know, um, uh, war zones, etc., uh, to uh, antiquity or the Middle Ages. I think it's a more um, not so clear uh, picture. We have both. We have the confrontation, but we all have also a very strong exchange. There's still a lot going on between the Arabs and the Byzantines. And there is uh, a lot moving uh, from one to the other direction. Mm -hmm. We have also in certain other aspects uh, a lot of uh, exchange of knowledge, mm -hmm. of material, etc. And I think this is very nicely reflected in these two ships. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, we, we get uh, this general uh, view of, of um, transitional period, the way how uh, the different powers had to, to change in order to gain the upper hand, uh, etc. On the other hand, it shows how, uh, on the same time, they also sometimes, you know, uh, interact. Mm -hmm. And this is that, that's why we, uh, we should not look only uh, to one aspect, like the uh, shipbuilding, so the construction itself, but also to the cargo. The cargo tells mm -hmm. us a lot, uh, and it's it's quite often a very complex picture, not so easy to to explain. I don't yeah. know if that that uh, answers your question. Or, um... I think it does. I mean, I don't know how many people uh, in, you know joining us today are necessarily familiar with the contents of those ships. So, for Serge Lamana, for example, how does it illustrate that we have this interconnection between these communities? Um, we have um, uh, so we have the transportation of of uh, different uh, materials, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So from the cargo or from amphora, uh, so sources to primary sources like uh, like glass, like raw mm -hmm. productions, uh, different. Yeah. Um, those ones, the markets, uh, have been taken over from one or to the other uh, hand, uh, but these obviously not necessarily stop uh, mm. being active. Yeah. So uh, there is still a lot going on. And uh, if I remember well now the details, mm. um, you still have you know, uh, the requests of, of certain products. Mm -hmm. But of course, the, the certain shipwrecks reflect uh, like a time capsule, they reflect the momentum, mm -hmm. but this it does not reflect the wider, uh, the bigger kind of um, historical development. Yeah. So at that moment when these ships sank, there was still something active, something mm -hmm. going on between the two sides or between different markets mm -hmm. um, and production centers. Uh, this, in the bigger context, could have changed. And uh, we know that uh, in the later centuries, the entire uh, Levantine coast was then really kind of out of, of, of reach for the Byzantines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying. They, in a way, we've got, you know, we've got this one narrative in a way of what we have with the conquests, with the military fighting, but yet underneath that or parallel to it, we still have people working together. We still have exchange of goods and services and so on and so forth. Exactly, yes. All right, okay, okay. Now we've got a couple uh, questions that have come up in the chat actually. One is from Alif. Um, she is actually asking how were the ships sealed and protected on the exterior? Were you've documented other changes in technology, the way the ports were being built, the infrastructure, the way the ships were being constructed, but were there any particular changes on the outside, the way they were sealed up or you know waterproofed? It's a good question. Uh, 
from the sources, I uh, we have nothing which uh, informs us about that, as far as I know. From the archaeological uh, context, uh, there are probably also um, maybe others, uh, like Matthew, you may also know from mm. some examples where we have detailed indications of a certain change, but um, not as far as I can yeah. tell that there is uh, any. Uh, we have changes uh, definitely from classical antiquity to late antiquity, mm -hmm. but within the Byzantine era and uh, in this uh, geographical uh, area, mm -hmm. I uh, can't think now at the moment of any uh, specific change, but um, if there's anyone who can uh, tell us more about that, I'm also uh, glad to, to learn about it. Yeah, the only the only change I can think of is similar to what you said. It's really there was a shift between they were using, I think, copper sheathing on the outside of the ship. And then that was gradually replaced by thin sheets of lead to yeah, help walk yeah. through the ship. But that was happening long before many, much of the much of the history you're talking about. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. But within the time span we are talking, um, I couldn't so far come across any specific indications of you know uh, that there are some changes but um, i'm curious to see also from other uh wreck finds to find out more yeah yeah i'll be curious to see what happens uh so there's so more or so more uh, much more to find and to understand yes, there's always much more to find uh so paul paul Selai, who's joining us from iowa where the winter is coming um he's asking about the geography of the coastlines around the aegean and so this really variegated coastline obviously provides numerous natural harbors so is it possible that the density of the ports and the connectivities in the region might even be underrepresented as compared to other parts of the Mediterranean. Uh, well, I mean, for sure, the Aegean Sea, with its hundreds of thousands of, of uh, islands, islets, uh, etc., they provided all different kinds of um, harbor infrastructure. Let's say, in in a, in a broader sense, it spans from a uh, simple uh, base. Uh, where ships could just have shelter to uh, bigger roadsteads uh, mm. and uh, different uh, harbor facilities, which again start uh, from smaller private infrastructures, the ch church infrastructures as its uh, own, to staple markets, uh, bigger uh, transshipment centers and the big uh, ports. Mm. Um, whether it is, um, it is for sure much more complex and bigger than we uh, know uh, for the moment. But in compared to other coastlines, uh, not necessarily underrepresented. I think there are other coastlines or areas which uh, haven't been studied as mm -hmm. well as the Aegean Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, like the north coast of Africa, for example. Exactly, exactly, yeah. especially that, that coast which mm -hmm. we almost don't know anything about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, obviously, yeah. I mean, the Aegean Sea, uh, just for its uh, geographical characteristics, is for itself a very uh, complex uh, setting, much more complex than any, any other coast in the wider Mediterranean. But um, in terms of the network, oh, there is so much more to find out, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, Alexis Wick, who's actually uh, one of the history faculty here at Coach University, he's curious, he wants to, I think, clarify an issue with your, with your general study. Is, and I'm quoting him, is he right to understand that your analysis in a way returns to the thesis of Henry Pyren, which involves a radical break in Mediterranean exchange and commerce with the so-called Arab conquests in the seventh century AD? Uh, I wouldn't say that there is a, a radical break. Um, I would not, actually I would not support to call it a break at all. 
it's just a change. It's mm. different. Uh, we are always talking about uh, the same like when it comes to compare the classical antiquity to late antiquity and the Middle Ages. We tend to to say that uh, everything collapses, everything is, is just mm. stopping, or it's uh, going down, whatever. But it is not. It's just changing. Mm. It's just we, we only have to understand it. Um, yeah, actually, to better understand it because it's so much different. Mm. Um, the Arab uh, Byzantine relations and uh, the geopolitical and economic uh, situation from the seventh to the at least eleventh uh, centuries um, makes a, a, you know uh, makes the entire Mediterranean, especially the East Mediterranean, upside down. But mm. so we have these transitions in various different aspects. Uh, but it's only we do not uh, we even can see uh, from different aspects of Byzantine archaeology that there is no what's also called the dark ages etc it's not valid mm -hmm. that's not true it's just we have not understood it so far and it's mm -hmm. actually continuing it's just shifting it's just moving it's just changing so i wouldn't say that no okay yeah i think i mean that something occurred to me that often a lot of the ideas for like the pyran the Pyren thesis in which the arrival of the Arabs caused this dramatic sort of dark age in the Mediterranean. It's based upon the idea, as you mentioned, that the Roman empire was like the height of everything. But I've read a lot of recent scholarship that actually argues that in a way the Roman empire as this thing that actually united the Mediterranean was very much an anomaly in the Mediterranean. The fact that the Mediterranean is fragmented and broken up into all these different units, that's much more representative of normal life in the Mediterranean. So in a way, this unified thing under the Roman Empire was very much an anomaly. Exactly. Yes, I totally agree. I totally yeah. agree. Uh, and actually, we see, uh, that's why I also put uh, the circulation of uh, ceramics of pottery and amphora into my paper because it also reflects that uh, nothing really stops. We get only uh, other projects and such, which, which again, at some point, we have a new peak of circulation, new peak of, of economy, of um, um, prosperity. Hmm. Um, it's just in a very different way. Um, what we had for the sh short time period in the Roman Imperial period which is basically in terms of history only a small time uh yeah. section yeah we we quite often uh, used to stick with that so we've got two more questions in the chat unless anyone else has something they would like to add one is from Dimitris draculis and he's asking if there was any sort of evident hierarchy between the different ports in the Aegean or I propose, I suspect elsewhere in the Mediterranean. Oh yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, uh, the port network and hierarchy is actually uh, very, very complex. Um, both within a region itself and then also between the regions, the different regions and uh, wider areas themselves. Um, as I said before, it starts from small uh, private facilities, uh, which um, go basically the, the hierarchical pyramid up to uh, the next local uh, transshipment centers, and et cetera, et cetera, up to the big port cities. There is a very strict um, hierarchy which actually also follows the uh, organizational hi hierarchy or the organization of the province itself, as you have shown in your works uh, very nicely. So I think it, it fits very, very well together. All right, thank you. Now, last question from Tuba Sarajalulu to, obviously, to um, Pardon Tal Kiviadis. Um, she's curious if, if the material cultural knowledge transference of 
this information. Does it correlate with methods of repairs, restorations of the ships and their construction as well? Um, how to uh, answer that uh, question? Um, so would they trans, you mean the transfer of, of knowledge and the transfer of material culture? if this is also reflected in the, the uh, or correlates with the repair or the, the, the shipbuilding uh, itself. Do you mean that in order to clarify the, the question really? Yes. Okay. Um, we have um, yes and no, <laughs> <laughs> I would say. <laughs> um, we have a lot of uh, transfer of material culture, which obviously was needed uh, for the construction of ships, for the construction of harbors, etc., etc. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, in the ninth century, for example, also the uh, central government of the Byzantine Empire forbidding Venice, for example, to export uh, wood to the Arabs. Mm -hmm. So there you have this link where uh, for a certain production needs, you, you have to contact certain areas, certain players, et cetera. It's, it's closely related, but then obviously uh, that did not uh, hinder the, the uh, Arabs to build up their uh, marine in the Mediterranean. Okay, so we actually have a follow up um, from Elizabeth. She's curious, following on the question of port hierarchies, uh, she's curious if it's possible to perhaps speak of or even identify. Could you say that there are certain hubs or ports that are international and then others that are serving only domestic purposes? Uh, yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Okay. So we have, uh, um, we have local, facilities, uh, regional facilities, uh, and supra-regional facilities, if I may say it so. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, if you would have uh, a big uh, trading uh, merchant uh, ship mm -hmm. sailing from Constantinople towards uh, the West, uh, he would not, uh, he would not stop at uh, any kind, uh, any random harbor in the, with, uh, within his, uh, the shipping lane, so his route. Mm -hmm. uh, but he would know which are the big centers I can uh, stop to uh, load or unload certain goods. Mm -hmm. Obviously, these bigger hubs, which are connected in, within the wider economic uh, network, they would get uh, or distribute the certain products to the smaller, uh, more regional uh, and local markets. Um, we have also very nice textual evidence. Uh, for example, uh, in, the, um, in the 14th century, when uh, the imperial fleet was uh, sailing to, from Italy back to Constantinople, they at some point stopped and, uh, due to bad weather conditions. They were caught in a, a small, uh, on an island. And uh, they ran out of, uh, of food and water supply. But instead of getting them ex uh, directly uh, at the local markets where they were anchored, they sent one ship to the next neighboring harbor, which was the known connection point to get the provision, which means that um, you have certain stops where you know uh, you could get some uh, some stuff, uh, mm -hmm. either goods to uh, for uh, selling or or even provision. Only if if you get caught with bad weather, so you you would you know try to to uh, hide wherever it's possible. But generally, there is a very very distinct and precise uh, hierarchical network 
of ports uh, for uh, the trading routes and, and, and shipping uh, lanes to use. Okay, thank you. So I think we have one more question that keep popping up. And unless anyone, there are any other questions after that, I think it's almost time to finish as we've been uh, speaking and listening to Alkibiades for about an hour. So the last question from Sarah, she's uh, apologizing if you may have spoken about this, but she was having audio problems. She's curious if you, you or if any archeometric analyses were performed on the maritime concrete of the harbors in Greece that you illustrated? And if so, what were, the what were the results? What did you learn about the potential presence or absence of Pozzolanic material? Uh, thank you very much for this very nice uh, question. Um, actually, it's there uh, just now about to take uh, samples. Uh, so I'm also uh, waiting from the archeological services about the, uh, the results um, so far there hadn't been uh, taken because like in Turkey and Greece, it's very complicated to take uh, samples and obviously also quite uh, expensive. So, so far they have only been analyzed by, um, you know, uh, microscopical uh, analysis, but not uh, petrographic uh, uh, chemical analysis about the consistency, whether, what kind of potolanic material they had inside, if uh, so, uh, yeah. The only what we can uh, tell for the moment is, uh, it seems that they did not, or uh, did not follow the Roman uh, hydraulic concrete uh, with the volcanic ash or any kind of this uh, mm. volcanic uh, additive uh, or even uh, crushed marble or so. Uh, but more uh, rougher uh, brick, uh, mm. crushed, crushed brick, as it gets uh, quite common uh, from, uh, especially from the sixth century onwards. But this is an entire open topic which has not yet been uh, understood and uh, studied uh, very well. And I'm just now uh, about to uh, to look more into into that. Okay, yeah, I'm looking forward to the results. You, uh, for those of you who don't know, Alkibiades and I are not only in the same city, we've known each other for a few years. And I think about a month ago, he told me that it's even possible some labs are now doing uh, carbon-14 dating on mortar and concrete, is that correct? Yes, it is, it is actually, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it depends on uh, whether uh, the mortar has organic material uh, inside, if not, uh, it's a bit more complicated uh, method, more expensive method, because you have to date based on the lime uh, itself. Mm -hmm. And there are only very, very, very few <laughs> laboratories who, uh, that can do that. Uh, yeah. But we were able to do that uh, for a harbor site I'm currently uh, excavating here in uh, Turkey. Mm -hmm. And we got very nice, uh, results of that and we are just now trying to to publish uh, and introduce that dating methods uh, mm. of, of uh, mortar yeah yeah I'm, I'm really curious i really want to see the results of that because i would love to apply it to some of the work i'm doing but that, that starts be, to, what's that yeah that would just answer so many questions we have it would, it would start to make things much easier, but that leads us into a very different topic and I suspect an entirely different presentation. So we've been taking up Alkibiades' time this evening for well over an hour. He's been very patient with our questions and he's also <laughs> been very generous with all of his knowledge as well as his very thorough and uh, synthetic presentation. So if there are no other questions this evening, I simply want to finish by thanking him again for all of his time and his knowledge and joining us this evening. And I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening or this afternoon or this morning, depending upon where you are.